testing a claim about a population using sample data. We are testing the probability of something happening given that our null hypothesis is true. All right, so our null hypothesis is a statement of what we expect to happen. So if we have an art, you know, an article that says 20% um, of American adults eat fast food once a week, okay? And then we take a sample that doesn't seem to line up with that 20% number. What we are gonna do is we are gonna perform a hypothesis test. We're gonna assume that the article is true. We're gonna assume that their proportion is valid and that 20% of American adults do eat at fast food once a week. Okay, so the middle of our curve is 20%. And then we're gonna take our sample and see where would our sample fall if the true population proportion is in fact 20%. Okay, so your null hypothesis when you're writing those out, that is the statement of really nothing strange happening, all right? The article says it's 20%, it is 20%, all right? Um, nothing cool going on, nothing, no wow factor, no correlation sometimes between two variables um, is going on. That's your null hypothesis. Um, you know, we're looking at the amount of time adults spend on TikTok versus the amount of time teenagers spend on TikTok. Uh, we know that would probably be more for teenagers typically, but um, the null hypothesis would, on that would be that it's the same, all right? There's no difference um, because there's no, you know, wow factor in that. There's no um, shocking value, I guess. There's nothing that separates those two values. Um, so the null hypothesis is always going to be whatever the article states or whatever the study says, or if it's a two proportion or two means, is that those two means are in fact equal because there's, there's nothing going on between those two populations, okay? Um, like I said, adults and teenagers, there's nothing different about them. They're essentially the same. Um, that would be your null. Now we would know there that we would probably find some convincing data on that particular test with the hour spent on TikTok. Um, and then what we do is we take the values from our sample data and then we, um, the values from our sample data we use to do this is our test statistic, okay? Um, that is where our sample falls on the normal distribution. And I'll show you guys some uh, some graphics here in a, in a minute that will hopefully kind of clarify that a little bit. Um, and then once we once we put our sample on our normal distribution, okay? So our normal distribution, I'm gonna try something real quick because I, I really feel like I need to illustrate this. Um, all right, so I've got my iPad here. So, all right, so if our null is 20, okay, well, since we're doing means today, we'll say it's 20 um, hours on TikTok, okay? Then we would put that in the middle, okay? So let's say the average teenager spends 20 hours on TikTok. Um, and that's what, so that's what we would expect. We would expect that to be the most common value found. And then we take a sample, okay, that has an average of, uh, we'll say 20 hours a week. I might've said 20 hours a day. Clearly that's not true. Um, a sample of 28 hours a week. Okay, that's what we found from our sample. All right, well, 28 is going to go right all the way down here. Okay, so um, this is our test statistic, which is going to be zero if you're observed is the same as you're expected. But then we would have some sort of positive t value here based off of our sample size. And then the p value is the probability of that occurring. So, what's the probability of getting our a sample as extreme as the one that we did pull. Okay, um, so that is what our p-value represents. Your t-value or your test statistic, which for means will be a t-value, uh, is going to be where it um, falls on the normal distribution. So you can kind of use a, a, a z-score or a t-score as the same way as a p-value. If you have a really high 
Z score or a T score, it means you're far away from the mean. Okay, um, so that kind of, uh, and they're usually the AP grading rubrics will accept that if you say our, you know, since our T value is extremely high, we reject the null. Okay, but typically we use our P value. If the P is low, you drop the hoe, reject the hoe. If it's not low, you fail to reject the hoe, which we'll get into more a little bit later. Um, so I did want to show you all that's that's where that is. The T value tells you, or T statistic, um, tells you where it falls at on the normal distribution. And then your P value is the probability. It's the normal CDF, the T CDF, using that T score, um, observed minus expected divided by standard deviation, same for any of those and um, the um, and then you know with a mean of zero um, since it's centered at the, at the middle there okay so that is sort of what that is I hope that breaks that down a little bit better um, as we kind of work through this today and so here's here's a, an example that you probably can see a little bit better than my quick sketch there. Um, so if I got a T value of 1.25, all right, the mean is zero, the middle is zero, because that was our null value. If our observed is the same as our expected, they're going to subtract to be zero. That's why the T curve is centered at zero, or the Z curve if you're doing proportions, um, the normal curve. So then our sample fell right here. So since our sample fell right here, okay, and for this particular test, we it's a two-tailed test. So we would just be saying, you know, the mean is not equal to whatever the study says, okay? Um, 20 hours a week spent on TikTok, the mean is just not 20. It doesn't specify greater than or less than, it's just not 20, so not equal to 20. So that's why we had a two-tailed test here. So then our T value is 1.25. So our sample fell right here. That was its um, that was its test statistic. We took its value, subtracted um, the expected value, which would be 20. Okay, um, 28 minus 20, and then divided by our standard deviation, and we got 1.25. Um, and 1.25 put us here, and then we calculated the p-value um, from with a TCDF 1.25 to infinity multiplied by two for the two-tailed. And that's where we got our p-value of 2179, which is not low in this particular case. Okay. All right, so um, I feel like I've been talking a whole lot here these first 15 minutes. So how is a hypothesis test different for a mean? Um, I'll go back real quick. Um, the 1.25, that is where you take your observed, let's, let's go based off of our TikTok example. Our sample had an average of 28 hours and our um, mean was 20 hours. So anytime you're doing a test statistic, which is mean, um, Z-score or T-score, um, well, anytime you're doing a Z-score or T-score, chi-squared is different, we'll get to that next week. But you're going to do observed minus expected. We observed 28 hours. We expected it to be 8. Uh, or we expected it to be 20. So that subtracted to be 8. And then we divide by the standard deviation. Just like thinking back to unit 1 or 2 doing um, uh, um, I see in the chat y'all's question. And I realized I kind of put this slide a little bit ahead of the next thing. Um, a little bit out of order there, my bad. Um, so we would divide by the standard deviation, which is on your formula sheet that I'm, I'm gonna uh, pull up here in just a second. So how are hypothesis tests different from means? Um, there are a few differences um, in terms of our state plan do conclude. Um, the first one is our hypothesis is gonna use mu instead of p. So we're trying to estimate the true mean instead of the true proportion. Um, yes, the T-score formula, the general outlay of it is the same as the Z-score formula, but the standard deviation is different, and we'll look at that on the formula sheet, and hopefully I can clarify that um, for you as we, as we work through. Um, so for our normal check, we use central limit theorem, 
not large counts, which we'll go in depth for a minute. And then the one that um, I see in the chat, why are we using a T instead of a Z score? Um, we do not use a Z distribution. We are gonna use a T distribution to run our test based on the degrees of freedom um, which that is based on our sample size. It's n minus one. We talked about that a little bit last week. Um, it's kind of a weird formula. It's hard to wrap your mind around, um, but it's n minus one. And that is important that you write that in the work you show. Okay. Um, another difference is that you do not pool your samples when running a two sample test for means. We did pool them last or two weeks ago with proportions when we were um, checking our normal condition and when we were doing our standard deviation formula. Your calculator for proportions is not gonna ask you pooled or not pooled, but for means it will, and you're gonna select not pooled, okay, when you have two samples. So you're uh, separating, you're keeping your samples separate. You're not pooling them together for your normal check, for your degrees of freedom, or for your standard deviation. Okay, don't pull means. Anytime it asks you, the answer is no. Um, but you need to be aware that with proportions, you do need to pull them, especially for that normal check. You have to do that p hat combined um, times your two sample sizes. Okay. Um, so yeah, those are really the main differences. But this main setup kind of follows the same thing. Um, there's a lot of similarities that you can do. And um, when we do the example today. Um, I'm going to kind of show you a good strategy on free response with this particular question to get the easy points knocked out first and then fill in the gaps of the things that are more complicated. Okay, so back to our um, what we were talking about on T distribution versus Z distribution. Okay, so here is a cool little GIF. GIF, I'm sorry, I know that stresses people out when people say GIF instead of GIF and I'm trying to correct old habits. I'm Oh, is it play? Oh, I think it's I'll play a video embedded in the OBS doesn't get it to Vimeo. So anyways, um, so you can kind of see it going on over there. Oh, I bet it's going to freeze up again there because I swapped windows. Um, I don't think it froze up. That's surprising. So as you have a T distribution, okay, and we'll see this on the formula sheet in just a second. Um, as you increase your sample size, your T curve gets closer and closer to a Z curve. And that's what the, um, that's what the hypothesis, or that's what that um, website kind of shows you, is that your curves, as you increase your sample size, which in turn increases your degrees of freedom, it pulls it in and makes it more and more normal. So it starts out kind of more flat, as you can see with the um, with the green curve. Okay, you can see it's more spread out. And the more orange curve is the normal curve, the Z curve, normal CDF that we're used to, standard normal distribution. So with degrees of freedom of one, it's more spread out. And then as you increase your sample size, which increases your degrees of freedom, it starts to suck things in and pull it closer to that actual standard normal curve 
the Z distribution.